Welcome to section 4 on external data sources. This is the first video of the section on integrating CSV data. In the previous section, we covered the basics of responsive design, as well as how to resize visualizations based on their container size, essentially responsibly redrawing visualizations. In this video, we'll set up a local host for external data files and proceed through the d3.csv function to construct a plot scatter plot. Before we jump into the first topic of the section, setting up a local host, it should be noted that many viewers may already have a local host set up and thus may skip ahead to the next portion of the section. Also, that the following walkthrough of setting up a local host is centered around setting up a Windows 7 or 8 local host through IIS, or Internet Information Services. Detailed instructions for setting up local hosts of types other than IAS are available all over the internet and should be consulted if you would like to set up any other type. Alternatively, you can watch through the section before setting up your local host on your own time. On Windows 7 or 8 machines, you'll want to start by enabling Internet Information Services. Head to your control panel and click on the Program link. Under Programs and Features, you should see the option to turn Windows features on or off. Click there. If it's not already enabled, click the box next to Internet Information Services, the fourth down on my screen. Go ahead and click on it to make sure that all of its subcomponents have been selected as well. You'll need to restart your machine for this change to take effect. Next, let's place our data onto our local host. Check in the resources for the video and download data.csv. If you've restarted your machine, there should be a new folder under C titled inetpub. Once you're in C slash inetpub, head to www.root. This is where you should place your data.csv file. However, note that if we attempted to load our CSV file from our local host through JavaScript at this point, we would receive an error specifying an access control allow header error. This involves a header that must be returned from an HTTP GET request from our local host or anywhere, enabling external scripts to access the materials on the site. You may need to search for it, but we're going to need to open Internet Information Services Manager to add a universal header that will enable our call to the local host. If you're on a server configured in another way, Apache, Jetty, so forth, check out the W3 specs on cores or enabling cross-domain access to your page to see what header syntax you should use. For Internet Information Service servers, you'll need to open the Internet Information Service Manager, click on the Sites tab to the left, and then the Default Website tab. Click on HTTP Response Headers, and then add the following header. Access control allow origin is the name and an asterisk is a value. The asterisk permits scripts loaded on any site to access your site's resources. You may also specify particular sites or IP addresses like your own if you want your data to be more secure. With our local host set up, let's take a look at the data on our data.csv. Upon opening the CSV, we should note that there are a header row in the file. Something to note is as it changes whether you use the d3.csv.parse or the d3.csv.parse rows functions. It's also important to note that there are no spaces in the titles for the header row. If there were, we would need to manipulate the CSV or treat the header row as a normal row and then disregard the data. In short, Leading spaces in CSVs disable you from easily accessing the groupings of the object array we'll eventually turn our CSV into. Let's jump into the editor, load the data into D3, and verify the contents. Let's start out with our usual boilerplate. I've gone ahead and added some basic components, including width, height, padding, and a variable titled data. If you open your source code, take a look at line 23. We've got a d3.text method. Note that we could have used a d3.txt. CSV function for our GET request to the local host, but text is slightly more versatile, allowing you to load CSV, TSV, JSON, and so forth. The only difference is the d3.txt method takes a MIME type as the second parameter, which I've specified as text slash CSV. The basic format for the d3.txt method is the URL source of the data, the MIME type, and then a callback function into which we'll eventually mold our data and build a visualization. Our callback function starts by accepting a parameter called unparsed data, which will accept the results of the d3.txt call. In the following line, we assign the value of the d3 of a d3.csv.parse method to the data variable. d3.csv.parse takes the string that unparsed data currently is and returns it as an array of objects organized according to their rows and with the headers that apply to each column of each CSV rows as keys in an object key value pair. 
note if our data hadn't had a header row, we would have used the d3.csv.parse rows. We then begin to verify our data with a function called log countries that takes element, index, and array parameters. Notice we call the function two lines below with a for each method. This uses our previous construction, which tells the for each method exactly what each we're talking about and accessing the data we want printed. Because our CSV parse function has separated the rows of our CSV into key pair values, one of which was country, we can simply iterate through every index value of the array that is our data variable and look for the country key. We've also console logged a little header. The countries are colon, new line, all of our countries. If you'll open your code in the browser and check on the console, you should see what you were expecting. The countries are, and all of the countries from our CSV file. Let's head back to the editor and get started on our scatter plot. With our scatter plot, let's check out the relationship between population and GDP caps. You can open up your 4.1.2 HTML source code or edit your own code as we work through it. To start out with, we've created empty array variables for both our GDP caps and population data. We can use the same general for each method on our data variable to push the needed values into these arrays. Utilizing the data in this way will keep us from needing to iterate through our data source in a prolonged manner inside of our scale calls we will eventually use to render the scatter plot. The addition signs make sure that everything that's pushed into our two array variables is an integer instead of the string format that the CSV is currently held in. Note that besides that, it's the identical format to our previous call to verify the data, and that we call the data for each method on both of our above functions below. Next, we can move to our standard enter and append procedure for scatter plots. Notice that we've passed our data variable on the data method. This will create a circle placeholder for every object in the array. Into the circle attributes variable, we'll pass our GDP cap and population, keys of our data is the CX and CY attributes that should be iterated through, unlike in our scales, where we're passing the simple arrays we've already extracted the values we need into. We do this as our scales method wouldn't automatically iterate through the objects in our data variable. Besides the few lines of initial data preparation, note the only other difference between a normal scatterplot example is our Windows on load function that simply waits so that the chances of our data call having returned are higher before the scatterplot is actually rendered. As expected, we have a scatter plot with 36 points, each corresponding to the GDP cap and population values present in a single object in our array. If you're looking for an additional challenge, you could either add the country values as tooltips to our plots or give the circles different fill values based on the continent they're from. A hint, adding tooltips can be accomplished by accessing D country and appending text elements with a class tooltip, while coloring the elements can probably be most easily achieved through placing the continent values into their own array through for each, and then adding an if else loop to the fill value for the circle. Now that we've established our CSV mastery, let's move on to the next video titled Utilizing JSON Data. See you then.